Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another Teacher Joseph podcast. Today, we're talking about steps to fluency, the things that you can do to make yourself more fluent. Well, first of all, we need to define what fluency is. For me, fluency is seeing perfect grammar and vocabulary, as well as no spaces between words from my students. But you might define it differently. For you, perhaps fluency is being able to read a page of a Harry Potter book. Perhaps fluency for you is simply understanding the colleague or customer at work. <clears throat> For many people, they use this word fluency as a kind of nirvana. Oh, Teacher Joseph, when will I be fluent? When will I reach that perfect place, that nirvana of English, where all native speakers are? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there isn't such a place. Really, if you're expecting some pot of gold at the end of the rainbow of English learning, it really isn't there. And as soon as you reach what you might consider to be a place of fluency, you soon discover there's more to learn. As a teacher, I try to avoid seeing English as a straight line with a destination. I prefer to view English as a circle with infinite possibilities. To view English in that way always leaves room for new words and new vocabulary. Every day I receive new words and new expressions from my students, things which I hadn't heard before as a native speaker. So it's very interesting. And that proves to me that the English world is a very big and very diverse place. To view English as something which never ends allows us diversity to meet new people, to have new experiences. And that's a very different thing from one day saying, OK, I've learned the English, now I'm happy, so bye. <laughs> so you see, to determine fluency and what it means is really very, very important. The second thing about attaining some kind of fluency is all about a commitment. Now, none of us are very comfortable with that word. None of us really like commitment exactly, depending on what it is. But there has to be something there which keeps bringing us back to the table to learn especially after hard days. I'm noticing that people these days are looking for less of a commitment to English than before, which is why I think that commitment is number two on my number of steps to fluency. So number one, determining what fluency is, what you're after. Number two is your commitment to fluency. Now, these days in e-education, I think it's very clear to everyone that the days of a one-hour lesson uh, are kind of finished. And in the future, younger people are going to be looking for five minutes on social media, 15 minutes, a quick conversation, half an hour maybe. The people who tend to take lessons for one hour tend to be either older people or people who are studying for exams or people who have very special requirements like looking at pronunciation, for example. But I'm finding uh, on italki, the platform I work on, 
that uh, this idea of committing to one hour of learning is beginning to disappear. As a result, uh, platforms like italki and other ones are now either introducing shorter group classes or allowing students to book lessons with teachers for much shorter periods of time. And I think that's something you're going to be seeing more of in the future. Not ideal for anyone, but if I think back to the last six months on italki, I'm receiving loads of people who just can't seem to organize their time well enough to take one hour lessons. At the last moment, I get an email saying, oh, sorry, can't come today. I have a meeting with the boss. I have a meeting with my wife. I have a dinner with my family. Sorry. Uh, how that's handled is very much on an individual case by case basis. But people who do that a lot, of course, are not really showing much of a commitment to learning. And that's something which affects not only you, but the teacher and also the platform on which you are being taught. So that's something else to think about. The third uh, step to fluency, in my opinion, is almost certainly about purity. And what I mean by that is purity of thoughts. Because for learning to take place, it really has to happen in an environment where there's trust and where there's some kind of affirmation and celebration of what you're trying to achieve. What I'm hearing from a lot of people is that they are being intimidated by their spouses or colleagues when they're trying to learn. Uh, they are perhaps being um, in a position where trust doesn't seem to be uh, very much in existence. So I'll give you a few examples. I was talking to someone yesterday and the person told me that she doesn't want her family to know that she's learning English because they'll just laugh at her. Uh, someone else told me last week that they don't want their colleagues to know they're learning English for... Um, various reasons. One is that they think they'll be laughed at. Two is because um, they think that their colleagues might be jealous. And there's other reasons there as well, which, which I won't go into. But there's many people who really struggle with this. And as a result, there isn't a pure atmosphere there for learning. And some people might think, well, we learn anyway, but actually we don't. The mental atmosphere that's created by that uh, is enough to destroy your, uh, your ambition of learning. Um, you might be surprised to know that your thinking also can grossly affect how you learn. For example, if you're in a class of students and you have this view that, oh, that woman in my class, she's very stupid. It's really sad. She's not going to get anywhere because she's not intellectually gifted. If you really allow that thinking to um, come into your mind, then what it will ultimately do is to destroy your own learning process. Because if you begin to see um, an inability in somebody else, you're opening up that same thinking to happen to you. So let's say, for example, 
the woman's name is Susan. And you say to yourself, oh, Susan, she's so stupid. That's really sad. She can't learn. Because you've introduced that into your thinking, there's a possibility that, first of all, you're going to see it not only in Susan, but in other people and in things that you try to do or learn. Not necessarily your English, but in a much bigger way. So you see, when you introduce or you allow something into your thought process, it, it kind of resonates all throughout your consciousness. And you can expect your learning to dip a little bit if you're beginning to make comments about other people. Now, I'm not saying that we don't notice things about other people people, but usually the things we do notice aren't the things which are actually happening. So, for example, and I'm just using this as an example, okay? So, if, if I'm at the hospital one day and I go there a lot, people will begin to think, oh, teacher Joseph is very sick. I saw him at the hospital again today that's really bad. And next time you see me, you think, oh, teacher Joseph, you know, he has uh, some mark on his face or I saw him limping with his leg. So maybe that's his problem. And then inside the hospital, that becomes, oh, I saw teacher Joseph at the hospital it looked like he was going to the x-ray department. Oh, I saw teacher Joseph at the hospital. It looked like he was going to the cancer department, let's say, for example, okay? Now, I do like to go to the hospital a lot, and I have met people who've asked me, oh, I've seen you at the hospital. Are you sick? And the answer is no, I just really enjoy the coffee there. They do the best decaffeinated coffee that I can find anywhere in my town. So I love going to the coffee shop in my hospital. So you see, it's very easy to come up with a wrong idea about somebody. And when you introduce that idea into your consciousness you're also introducing that possibility into your own life. So you need to be very careful with what you're thinking, particularly around other people. And you might think that sounds a bit crazy, but actually it isn't as crazy as you perhaps um, have thought about in the past. Your thinking affects your worlds. Um, as I think it was Buddha that said, uh, with your thoughts you make the world. And in English we say, we say nothing is good or bad except your thinking makes it that way. So a lot to think about there, how you see other people, how you see your learning, and also how you see your world. And if you are living in a place where academia isn't celebrated, maybe you're living in a very small village or with very small minds around you, rather than allow them to condemn you, it might be an idea for you to change your thinking about them, because perhaps you're going to be the leader in their society. Just different things to think about. Well, that's it from me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this, and I'm going to say goodbye now, and let's talk again soon. See you.